Uh, tonight I want to talk about the power of environment. Yes. So if you've been, if you've been around SBO for any length of time, um, that's a word you'll have heard. Uh, uh, in environment. Building environments, creating environments, being a part of environments. Merriam-Webster Dictionary says this. Environments, get two definitions for you. Um, environment is the circumstances, objects, or conditions by which one is surrounded. Pretty basic. I like the second definition. Uh, the aggregate, or like the combination of, or the compilation of, the aggregate of social and cultural conditions that influence the life of an individual or a community. So it's the aggregate of, of, um, of social and uh, cultural conditions that influence the, the, uh, the life of an individual or a community environment. Uh, so as you probably know, as you may or may not know, but probably know, as full-time SPO staff, we have the opportunity to invite people to partner with us, right? In order to do this full-time, can people support us emotionally, cheer us on, spiritually, but most practically, financially, right? We, open hearts and open wallets. Come on, Lord, make it rain. Prosperity gospel. Mario, that's what we're all about. Um, but one of the questions that were regular, at least I have been regularly asked as I talk to people about SBO, is I'll ask the question, maybe you can finish the statement, what's the difference between SPO and focus? Focus, gosh! <laughs> focus missionaries in the house? Come on, my focus missionaries! <laughs> and your twin sister, right, at Mizzou. Back there, yeah, Jordan. Awesome. Or, or, or another question that I, I hate is like, Nick, what do you do? <laughs> Whatever it takes, okay? <laughs> Don't ever ask me that again. I hate that question, and I love you. Um, out of my insecurity, I try and defend, like, oh, I do stuff, and I meet with people. Or the worst part is, like, I'm grabbing coffee with Rehan. He's like, so what do you do for work? I'm like, this. <laughs> <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> oh, it's happened plenty of times. Another way of asking that question is, is what is the call? What is God's call for SPO? Like, why SPO? Why is SPO a thing right now? Um, what is God calling S SPO to be? Uh, and at the end of the day, we believe that God has called us to be a transformational people who live deep relationship with God and with one another. To be, to be a transformational people who live deep relationship with God and with one another. That, that at the end of the day, like here's our mission. It's not college campuses. It's not even young adults. It's cities, right? It's at the end of, come on, let's get the city. Our mission is to build transformational communities that form missionary disciples for life and affect and transform cities. Family life. Like, that's it. Like, let's have powerhouse families. Um, it's not just, it, and, and, and hopefully, hopefully in the environments that we create, for however long you're, you're, whatever the season is that you're in this environment and in this community, our hope is that even personally, you can experience God's call for your life and you can be launched. You know, wherever that is. It might be here in Kansas City, it might be somewhere else. Make Seymour, rest in peace in Iowa. We love you. But that man's lit up. He's like, I'm going to start community here. I don't know how, but we're going to do it. So to launch you into God's purpose and call on your life. Um, so we have what we call charism values. I'm going to start our timer. Um, so we have six charism values that really try and capture who we are and put language to our, our, our core values, ultimately. Brotherhood and sisterhood, renewal in the Holy Spirit, um, formation to Christian maturity. Um, one of them that I think really captures what I want to talk about tonight is, is community on mission. All this is by way of introduction, by the way. Um, and here's, here's what I'll just read it for you. Here's what it says. Uh, we are made for communion with God and with one another. Flowing from this conviction, community is at the heart of SPO. I love this. It is both the source and the fruit of our mission. 
It's like the, this, this source of energy, it's this thing that's greater than me, this, this source, it's like the means and it's the end, right? The source and the fruit of our mission. We are a people um, sacrificially committed to one another in a common way of life, creating an immersive culture that transforms lives. Here's what it says, centered around households and formation community, read Radical Core. Uh, we don't like officially have households yet, but like big dream of mine is like get some money and buy a bunch of awesome houses and have like f formation hubs for young adults like in like these hubs of evangelization just to blow it up in the city. Um, I just pull out my, never mind, I was gonna go down a rabbit hole. I was gonna talk about 401ks and Roths. I won't. Anybody heard of the podcast um, New Polity? Boo, did you boo it? Did you really? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm not sure what I think about it. Okay, this culture, so centered around a formation community, this culture forms potent environments that awaken faith in Christ and bring it to maturity. I love that. Potent environments that awaken faith in Christ within you and forms that to maturity. So in SBO, we believe that, that, that environment consists primarily of three things of the state of how people relate to each other, number one. The state of how people relate to one another, it's relationships. Like when you walk into an SPO environment, hopefully you either consciously or subconsciously experience these people relate to each other differently. There's something about it, brother and brother, brothers and sisters, sisters and sisters, you relate to each other differently. Even just what we did tonight, honoring each other. That's like something the world usually doesn't do. And if you've ever tried to implement that in your family life back home, sometimes it goes well. Other times when we're trying to honor Carol Red, everyone's like, I don't, I don't know what to tell her. Like, thanks mom. Like you can kind of get, sometimes it can go flat, but sometimes it can go awesome. Anybody ever done it with family? And like, well, just like, it's one of the like holiest, did it not go well? Or? <laughs> it's okay. So the state of how we relate to uh, each other. Um, a common vision you're chasing after. So environments consist of the relationships, a common vision you're going after, and how that environment is led. Okay, so it could be, a, it could be one of these nights, or it could be, um, unfortunately, Mike Mangione didn't come for the concert, but the last Luke Spihar concert, you walk into this environment, and it's like, oh, this is, these are, like, new people are being invited in. Um, there's this common vision of we're going to experience beauty. And we ended up worshiping God that night. And Jackie freaking slayed it as she led the night. And, and Luke Spear also led it. It's, 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 it's we're going somewhere in these environments. It's different from atmosphere. Atmosphere is important. Uh, at least within SPO, we would distinguish these two. Um, atmosphere is like, all you need is Edison bulbs, right? I mean, can I get an amen, church? All you need is Edison bulbs. Call it a wedding party. That's it. Um, you know, carpets, soft lighting, couches, like this stuff, super important stuff. Like th we're humans, sensual beings, not just angels. Like we need atmosphere that's really helpful, good music, um, but that's not environment. Are you guys with me? So environment uh, is, is the invisible hand that guides behavior, that forms the person that you are and influences your life and the life of a community, as Miriam Webster told us. So but what I want to talk about tonight, however, um, is, is your personal. So there's this environment, a corporate environment, that we can all be a part of creating. It's not on one person. It's all on all of us. But your individual personal environment, what you allow in to influence the culture that is within you, your thought life, your affections, like your whole person and your personality. This is the final talk of the first four talks of the year as we're kind of just laying the groundwork for the year. Um, the series, Strengthening Yourself in the Lord. And I want to have a conversation tonight around controlling or like governing uh, your personal environment, which, is, which affects your interior uh, life. So, in uh, preparing for this talk, I was just reflecting on environments in my life and I was taking back to 12 and a half years ago, I uh, was at a time in my life, I'll, I won't go through the details tonight, but that's basically when I came to Christ. Um, rock bottom, I was in a very different environment. Uh, I was bartending, I was 
still going to school, finishing up my sixth year of college, right? Come on, Who, where are my victory lap people at? Yeah. Who's like, I'm still going right now? Yes. Um, that's right, you doing, oh yeah, weightlifting? Weightlifting, come on, <laughs> out of JUCO. Um, I love it, not bad. It's good, you gotta wear a mask? Okay, that's all right. Um, where was I going with that? Okay, I was living in a, a but I, I come to this place, I hit a rock bottom, and like there's this shift of environments in my life where I, uh, I, I, I came to my, the point where I was forced to make a decision, a decision in my life. Uh, and the decision was to ultimately to follow Jesus. Um, and over the next year, and I would say especially the next few months, as I was still bartending, um, still like running with some people, um, the Lord dismantled, if you will, idols within my heart um, and, and, and actually pulled me out of particular environments. And as I was reflecting on this this week, I was reminded of this. Uh, uh, I, I read an interview with Decision Magazine and C.S. Lewis. Really cool interview. They asked C.S. Lewis this question. It says, in your book, Surprised by Joy, you remarked that you were brought into the faith kicking and struggling and resentful with eyes darting in every direction looking for an escape. You suggest that you were compelled, as it were, to become a Christian. And then they ask him, do you feel that you made a decision at the time of your conversion? Because as he writes about it, it's like I was, they asked him, did you, did you make a decision? Um, he says, I would not put it that way. What I wrote in Surprised by Joy was that before God closed in on me, I was offered what now appears a moment of holy free choice, but I feel that my decision was not so important. I was the object rather than the subject in this affair. He says, I was decided upon. Isn't that good? Like this is the message of Christianity, right? This is the hound of heaven. It's not you who chose me, it's I who chose you, right? And this is love, not that we love God, but God loved us and gave his son as expiation for our sins. It's, it's God acting on us. And we call it the prevenient grace of God. That's the foundation, that's where we start. And we play a role, right? There's this moment of decision where we give our lives to Christ, and, and then there are the daily decisions we make. What I want to hone on tonight, hone in on tonight, is, is, is about that. These decisions that I believe tonight, I think the Lord wants to reveal things that he actually wants us to cut out of our lives. Um, the word decision, break it open, decision, Right? You know what an incision is, it's a cut. To, a decision is to cut something away, is to cut something off, like the head of a freaking giant right? in your life. Like practical holiness is what I think he wants to go after tonight, to cut away. Um, JP2 in his apostolic exhortation on, it says, it's catechesi tridende. Um, he talks about the kerygma, the proclamation of the gospel. He talks about how critically important it is, the need for the, the initial ardent proclamation by which a person is one day overwhelmed and brought to the decision to entrust himself to Jesus Christ by faith. So the Catholic understanding of salvation, justification, right, salvation by faith through grace is I have been saved it's not a one and done, but I, I've been saved. I remember I was at uh, an airport a while ago and I prayed the blessing for my food and this old man across from me is looking at me when I'm done. He goes, son, have you been saved? I said, giddy up. <laughs> he found out I was Catholic and we were, it was, whoo, it was. I also, well, no, never mind, not part of the talk. So yes, how many of you have been saved? Okay, good, if you haven't, we'll talk. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will fully be saved someday. I have been delivered. 
I have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved son. I am in the process of being delivered, fully delivered someday. I have been healed. I am being healed, and I fully will be healed someday. And what I want to propose tonight is this, that it is vitally important, it is critically important that each one of us individually evaluates what contributes to the life of Christ in you being formed, like what contributes to that abundant life, and what takes away. What gives life? Add more of that. What is robbing you of life? Like, like a ruthless, searching, moral inventory right now in my life. What's giving life? And what's robbing me of life? It's the story of St. Augustine. He's, I don't know, in his backyard or somewhere, and he hears a voice, take up and read. Take up and read. And he sees the scriptures there. I don't know if it was the whole Bible, which would be pretty incredible. I mean, it was all handwritten. He at least had the book, of, the letter to Romans, um, which is cool. I mean, it's like incredible. Like he had the, a copy of the actual letter which we do too, which is pretty cool, but we just gotta remember that, like handwritten. And he opens it up and he opens to this. And this is for some of us right now, like let this word, let the word of God actually affect us. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, convict us. Paul says this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. I don't know who, this is for me. I don't know about you, this is for me. Nick, you know what time it is? It's the moment for you to wake up. For salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Okay, small group time. Just kidding, we got plenty more to say. <laughs> make no provisions for the flesh. This isn't just activities and things you do, but this is external input that is coming into your life. Netflix. I have friends that have just completely eliminated their Netflix account. I haven't yet. I actually don't have one, I'm using a friend's. <laughs> Dave, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'd be disappointed in me. He's like, buy your own corn dog, Nick. <laughs> Netflix, news, golly, the news is not news anymore. Um, YouTube, trivial entertainment, some of which honestly is benign. It's not that big of a deal. Some of, it, some of it is crushing our souls. Some of it is. And, and we like, there's an addictive reality to this, but I think it's important to remove some things from our garden, if you will, our internal world, particularly when we're in like a vulnerable or a fragile season, particularly then. Um, maybe it's a season of desolation. Maybe you're, you're recently, in, you've been in a breakup or there's been a loss in your family or some sort of trauma in your life where it might just be desolation, like I said, where Ignatius says you're, you're, you're drawn to low and earthly things. Like we're drawn to these things. Uh, and, and in these moments, it's, it's important that we have like, we make decisions that count for like a million other decisions. For example, the decision is, I don't do sugar. I do sugar. If you make that decision, you don't have to worry about making that decision all day long about all the other sugar options. Like, I, I just don't, I don't do it. It's not good. You guys tracking? I don't watch the news. So you don't have to figure out, am I gonna, am I gonna, am I gonna do it? So in these seasons, and I think just particularly in our time right now, particularly in this age, it's critically important that we simplify our focus Living in a loud world, simplify our activities, and to cultivate this clean garden. And it takes a ruthless, like, tenacity to get after it. I have a friend who's getting married in two and a half weeks, and for the last few months, because um, he's seeing D Day, it's like, Shiza, 
I thought this stuff was going to be over. I thought you, once I got close to getting married, all this stuff I've been dealing with was going to be worked out. Not the case. So for the last few months at 7.15, for 15 minutes, every Wednesday morning, we chat on the phone. And he has this list that he's been going through with a counselor. And he doesn't have a brother in his life that is willing to. He's down in Dallas that is willing to go through this with him and like walk with him in it and hold him accountable for what he wants to be held accountable for. But like very detailed. It's not like scrupulous, but he just knows himself. And so every morning we, we connect. Some of the things he, he's written down that he wants to like, we're going to talk about it every Wednesday. No viewing websites that could be arousing. I don't even know what this is, like Chive, never even heard of it, or viewing YouTube fitness videos. No viewing Bing or Google to search images. No watching movies or shows that could be arousing. No visiting bars alone or with friends who act out sexually. No using untracked computer or iPhone. Um, no second looks at girls at the gym. Like, super practical. Like, whoa. Bro, like this, talk about practical holiness. Like, I'm done. I got to be done. And I need somebody else to actually help me chop this stuff off. You guys, you guys feeling that? This is more of a weighty message than that. I feel it. I need it, though. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Feel free just to write it down or open it up if you want to follow along. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And then these two key verses. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one or love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Sandwiched between these two commands, one to store up treasure in heaven and the other to not serve money, are these strange words about the eye being the lamp to the body. He says, if the eye is good, that word literally means single. If your eye is single, if your eye is focused, the whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is evil, think diabolical, divided. If your eye is divided, your whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, what you pay attention to, what you watch, what you focus on will have an effect, not just on your mental or emotional or in, like interior spiritual life, but on your body, like on your whole person. We cannot separate the human person. This isn't just like a, a Christian thing. Like, this is what Jesus says, so Christians, this works for you. This is how God rigged the system. You guys track it? Like, this is how it works. Like, you try to be, if, you, if you're divided, your, your body is going to experience this division within yourself. This word for body um, is the same word that Paul uses in Romans 12 when he says to present your bodies to me. This isn't just like a physical thing. This is the whole person. The word is soma. It's the whole person. Paul says, uh, do not be conformed to this world, right? But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So if your eye is single, not duplicitous, not living a double life, your body will be full of light. Come Holy Spirit. The road is narrow. The road is narrow that leads to life. Wide that leads to destruction. Man, Jesus wants to narrow in our focus. It's so easy to get caught up on golly, social media. My parents hate that we don't put Tua on social media. 
Like, so but, but we got a photo stream on iPhone, mom and dad. You look at it there. But like, if we just like are like all over here, I'm like, we're missing right here. Like, what's Jesus doing in my life? So many things in this world are robbing us of life and joy and satisfaction of what's right in front of us. A couple more things. Mark 24, so what you pay attention to, what you see, what you watch. The other is, is what you hear. Mark 4, 24 to 25, Jesus says, pay attention to what you hear. Sometimes Jesus is cryptic. He says, the measure that you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For those who have, more will be given, and those who have nothing, even what they have, will be taken away. This is what we call a, like a kingdom principle. Uh, one of the first kingdom principles presented in scriptures is in Genesis, the principle of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. This is both good and not good. Sin begets sin. Generosity often begets generosity. There's a, there's a value system. It's called the, 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 so it's like taking a, an individual who is just has a sarcastic, cutting, bitter, resentful like environment within themselves, and you put them into a new work environment. After a month, watch those that complain and are bitter and are sarcastic will be just naturally gravitate towards this person and they'll just surround themselves in it. It's, it's the law of attraction is what the world would call it. But again, it's not just like a world thing. Like when they're onto something, that's, like, that's actually the way things work. Like we, we, we attract what, what, we, what, we, what, what we're desiring to even hear. Those that actually want to hear like pity on like, I, I, anybody in here like complain like I do and kind of want people to have pity on them? And that, that never actually helps, like ever. And I'm just like crushing everybody around me by my complaints. But I like want people to have like pity on me and I draw it to, to myself. Values attract like values, good or bad. These self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, and like, it's crazy. Sometimes I don't get Jesus' words. He says, he who has more will be given. Man, I don't, you probably know people in your lives who are super generous and are just super joyful and love good stories and love like hearing good stories. And like that stuff's like, all of a sudden like everyone's like sharing good stories with them and people are drawn to them and people give to them. And you have people who are like complain and are bitter and I never have enough. And it's like, even what you have will be taken away. So be careful what we listen to. Give me some good news, Jesus. The last thing I'll say is, um, what we hear, if we're not careful, has the potential to become a weed in our garden. We're not public property. We govern ourselves, right? Only you have the keys to guard your heart and your thought life. We're not open to everyone's opinion. Um, I had a lot more to say about community and fellowship and true fellowship. That's probably just needs to be a whole nother talk, but about sharing life with others but who is it in your life that you're allowing to speak into your life? Like being very intentional about that. My spiritual director, my bride, little baby Tua, a couple of you in this room to actually speak into my life. To like build us up, to encourage us. And I'm not talking about just being my cheerleader. I need people that are actually in my corner that'll tell me no. Nick, I don't think that's good for you. I don't like hearing that, Max. <laughs> but who in your life, like, hey, hey I, just, I, I, I just did this in my life, and maybe you, I don't want to get too specific, but. Yeah, who's challenging you, encouraging you? Who are the people that are speaking into your life? Okay, environment, 
combination of social and cultural conditions that influence the life of an individual or community. Be careful what you focus on, what you listen to, what you watch. Be mindful what you're allowing to influence your life. Sometime later down the road, we'll talk about who, more of who is influencing your life because you become, right, the, what is it, the five people that you surround yourself with? So here's a couple of questions. We're gonna take in a breakout group. We've got about 30 minutes here, 25, 30 minutes. Anybody not know what breakout group you're in? Did you guys see the group me today? Awesome, couple questions, small group leaders, if you wrote a couple down, that's awesome. If here, here's two just to take to group. Um, but what's something that you believe God may be asking you to cut out of your life right now? Like to make a deliberate decision to cut out. Shout out to my man, Lee Vollmer. Today he ordered, I never heard of this, but a wise phone, right? A, it's not a smartphone, it's a wise phone. And it, what does it have on it? Yeah. It's pretty cool. Like, for me, Teresa has my passcode. I can't download apps. I don't have Chrome. I don't have Safari. Like, currently, sometimes I ever put it back on for, to do some stuff. Um, but it's like, sometimes it's hard. But like, rarely is like urgent, urgent, urgent. Like, I need to look something up right now. Um, but it just, there's some, some banks to the river for me. And this is, that's, that's a decision I'm making. Um, I think the Holy Spirit wants to reveal some things to you. What are some things he's asking you to, maybe just put some banks up just so we can simplify the focus in our life, even if it's for a season. Um, and the next question, um, what in your life, so that's like some bad stuff maybe, what in your life is actually currently contributing to like a healthy, godly environment in your world? Share that. Like, hey, this is something that's actually, I do, that really helps foster like, well, silence, solitude, hearing the voice of God, focusing on him. I meet with these people on a Monday morning because we have like awesome conversation around kingdom stuff. Like, what are some things that really work out well for you guys that we can give some other people just some ideas there? So those two questions, We've got about 25 minutes. Breakout group leaders, could you maybe just stand and then we'll be moving a lot of chairs, so find your group leader, find a spot, 25 minutes, we'll be back. Feel free to move couches around.